I do see the paradigm shift. Pandemic paradigm shift. Remote working is the new normal. Um, yes. I, I don't. I'm not really that great at marketing, but Jason seemed to think it was okay. So well, we went with it. So there you go. Jason's, Jason's not great at marketing either. Like that's one of the things we always say is we don't do marketing here. We do content and community because marketing right. is just weird and makes you cringe. So, all right. so we're all at home, right? We're all at home. We've been sent home. I mean, this is a thing, right? So name your virus plague. We've done our introductions. I'm not going to do any introductions about me and John. We've, we've uh, done a few of these things before. Hey, it's Corona this year, right? It could have been Ebola, SARS, any number of other dangerous viral strains. Stuff happens, folks. Stuff's going to continue to happen, and we're going to have to live and learn to adapt. But more to the point, remote working and the, the increasing reliance on internetworking is going to be something that we're all going to get used to. And what a beautiful thing the internet is. It has scaled. It is handling the problem. Yes, there are individual applications that are having some issues, but, but the network itself is an amazing, amazing piece of work. And we should all be grateful for the, the work that uh, DARPA did uh, back in the early 70s. Mm. The, the internet has no viruses. None of a biological kind anyway, right? Yeah, we, you know, before we were talking about the intermix of, you know, trying to deploy malware to people using the COVID-19. So if it's going to hit you, it's through a spear phishing ruse, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. All right. Given all that, though, and here I go, I'm going to use the CIA triad. The usual cyber dangers exist. We have to maintain confidentiality, integrity, availability of our systems, right? We still have to do this regardless of whether we're in the office or whether we're working at home, right? These things are a reality. So what is this virtual private network thing that we, we speak of, right? Well, virtual private networking technology has been around for quite a long time, right? There's a number of different VPN technologies out there. We've got site-to-site -site VPN. By the way, if you see me looking over to one side, it's because my display monitor for the presentation's over there. We've got site-to-site -site VPN. We've got client-to-site VPN. There are different types of VPN over history that have existed. IPsec tunnels in transport mode, tunnel mode, often site-to-site. -site. We've got SSL and TLS-based VPN portals and tunnels, which we're all familiar with. We even have such a thing called MPLS-based VPNs, which are not even designed for encryption. They're, in fact, more designed to carry virtual private networks for individual companies ac across uh, large internet providers. So VPNs are a thing. They've been around for many, many years. We're now using them more and more in a client-to-site mode. And when we use them in a client-to-site mode, we're talking about VPN endpoint software. So what is it exactly and why do I have to use it? Well, the VPN endpoint software secures that communication between your remote location, your laptop or your device, and your corporate office. It allows you to communicate with those protected devices in your corporate office. Normally, they're servers and applications that are not generally advertised out to the internet, right? It will require you to authenticate with some sort of credentials normally, often with a second factor of authentication for people that are doing it right. Right. And fundamentally, a VPN provides that confidentiality and integrity. It allows the organization, in other words, to extend their security policies out to your remote location. So there's a question that came up, and I just got this on my first of three IONS calls today. B asked, do you see as much VPN use these days with cloud usage? And I think that this gets into a problem you're going to talk about a little bit later whenever we discuss split tunneling. Ideally, when you set up a VPN, you want all the traffic to come to your company and then out so it can be monitored and you can watch and you, you, you have some control over that endpoint, that traffic. Yep. Most companies couldn't make that lift to have their VPN and their pipe expand enough to have all the traffic going through. So we see exactly. a large number of people that are splitting where the VPN traffic to internal IP addresses will go through the VPN, but the cloud resources like Office 365 and SharePoint on the cloud and Azure and all those, they're letting their users go to that. And that is not optimal. And Joff will talk more about that a little bit later. But exactly. most of what I'm seeing in our customers today is they're allowing their users to split tunnel, which is bad, 
but they're doing it specifically because of those cloud resources. So yeah, go ahead. That, that's, a, that's a very good point. Some of the consultancy volume that's coming our way, um, John's getting it, I'm getting it also out even outside of Black Hills is directly related to the split tunneling question. And, you know, we will talk about the dangers of that. That's exactly right. So split tunnel mode, it's like John saw my slide coming, right? If you deploy in split tunnel mode, just to give it a little bit of definition, well, you can use local and remote computing resources, right? You can access your corporate resources because certain network routes are defined by virtue of the VPN software running and dropping those routes onto your desktop. But the default route, and you can tell I used to be a network guy, the default route is gonna point to your local resource or your local router, and you're likely using a default DNS server. So split tunneling is really convenient for the perspective that you can still use the internet locally without having to send your traffic through the corporate network, but it is less secure because there are some dangers exposing your system to that local environment and the company themselves can't really enforce some of the security policies that they would have in place if you are running in a non-split tunnel mode where all of your traffic is going to the corporation. A classic example here is would be uh, uh, intrusion prevention systems or what formerly used to be called IDS systems. If we can't inspect all of your traffic anymore, then we don't have a view. We basically don't have eyes on from an instrumentation perspective what is coming out of your endpoint system. And that can offer up plenty of danger. And one of the things that a lot of vendors are trying to sell right now is the idea that you can deploy an agent, an endpoint security agent, an EDR agent on a workstation. You can protect that anywhere it is. And I have found that those particular claims are a bit dubious. Um, so be aware of that. And one of the things I'd recommend is try testing it. So if you're running something like Silence and you're using the cloud or whatever, you need to make sure, okay, if we have an endpoint, I'm at home, I'm going to load a um, interpreter agent on a system and we're going to see if it catches it. If it does, great. We expect it to do that. Is the alert actually showing up in the dashboard in a meaningful time frame? Not like four hours from now, but in a meaningful time frame as well. Exactly right. There's some, there's some significant uh, challenges there. You know, I just want to give a nod before we go too far down the technical road to the change that we're all experiencing personally here. What about your home office? What about your home environment? You're now stuck in it. Like for those of us that work at Black Hills, we actually laughed about this because John's like, hey, everybody, you're going to have to work from home. And, and I immediately piped up and said, oh, you mean like last week? And, and so for us, it, it has been one of those changes that we have adopted into our culture and all of us have gotten used to. But for a lot of you out there, all of a sudden, you are changing your daily routine in a very, very significant way. So I have a couple of quick recommendations that work for me, and I'm sure many of us at the Black Hills team have similar recommendations, right? First of all, set your hours. Have that prepared office space that is isolated, have it properly set up so that you can work from that space, and be specific and disciplined about your hours. When you go into that office space, you're working. As a part of that, you need to set your expectations. No family, you cannot bother me while I'm in here, right? If you have an urgent thing, then maybe, but you know, honestly, look, I, I see my wife will actually text me from the other end of the house with the question, can I bother you right now? And that's because I've set a certain expectation. When I'm in here, I'm working, I'm focused, I'm concentrating. The other thing I really like is kind of a go to work ritual. And I find this works really nicely, whether it's a little bit of meditation, whether it's something like yoga or some other sort of exercise, whether it's even just like a half mile walk, just a short walk, just something that gives you a transition from, you know, straight out of bed in the shower and straight into your office, just something to throw into the mix there. I have found personally helps me a lot. And then, so, you know, set up your refreshments as well, right? Have your break space, have your tea, your coffee, and all that good stuff that you normally would require. Jump. Your whiskey cask that's leaking, leaking all over your, your basement. <laughs> um, so we had somebody that brought up sassy, which I, I, I can't do. It's like sassy. <laughs> so whenever you're looking at a bunch of different technologies like cloud access security brokers or secure access service edge, 
the thing that I think is interesting whenever you're talking about VPN coupled with this is this is all stuff that we should have been doing as part of moving to the cloud anyway. And I think that a lot of these acquisitions from SASE to Cloud Access or CASB or Cloud Access Security Brokers, I think that moving forward, if you wanted to invest in a security set of security technologies, I think that things like CASB, I think that things like SASE are absolutely things that we should have been doing. Now, all of a sudden, people are trying to do them very, very, very quickly. So yes, I, I think that SASE is fantastic coupled with Cloud Access Security Brokers, but remember, all of those different technologies exist because the current cloud technologies that we have for securing Azure, uh, to a lesser extent, Amazon and Google Cloud Compute suck. They're absolutely horrible at trying to lock things down. So a lot of these technologies are trying to wrap some security around these technologies that just aren't giving us the level of tele telemetry and compliance certification that we need. So yeah. All right. Yeah, absolutely. yeah that was one of the, a lot of questions on that, Joff, about how do you ban VPN, how do you work with it, how do you mitigate it? You right, that at all. right. So let's uh, let's hold hold a few of those. Let's get through a little bit of technology discussion, and I think oh. we can then do a little bit more of that. So, you know, the next big one that comes up is your home network reliable and secure. This is a real question, right? The first thing that we all think of is, you know, what's living alongside me on this network? And if you step back and you think a little bit, you're like, okay, so yeah, there's a, an Alexa, maybe a couple of Google Homes or something like that. You've got a family compute sort of device somewhere, maybe a kiosk -y thing in the kitchen. You've probably got a gaming PC or a console of some sort. You've probably got dozens of mobile phones that not only you have on your network, but all your neighbors and your kids that come by your house have probably been given your Wi-Fi password as well, mostly by your children. And they have that uh, that uh, access to your network. So you're really in a cesspool at home, whether you like it or not, right? Well, and the other thing about that, like we go back to that split tunnel problem, right? If you look at certification, accreditation and compliance, is your home network for networks for your end users now part of what you would consider to be a protected zone. Let's use an egregious example, a couple of them, John. Right. HIPAA. If you're an insurance processing company and now all of your users are working from home and they can split tunnel, now all of a sudden you have personally identifiable information on home networks. You now have maybe PCI information, somebody that's doing processing of credit card applications and they're doing that from home. This becomes a CNA nightmare, and I know that a lot of this stuff is going to go by the wayside because of the um, the urgency of the situation that we're dealing with with COVID. But this is, I've had a couple of customers that call me up. They're like, what do we do with certification and accreditation and compliance of all this? I'm like, good luck, because we're yeah. all in this together. We and don't there's know no clear answer to that. Because everybody's had to adapt so quickly, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a serious, serious thing, all right? Well, so, and, and, and Chino53 said, how do you enforce people to secure their home network? Seriously, you cannot enforce this. And you're absolutely right. You just can't. No, they have to take the initiative. They have to listen to presentations like this, for example. Hopefully. Yeah. So simple home network model. Just about 99% of people out there are probably running a home network that looks very much like this. And it really is that simple. You've got some sort of wireless router that... Uh, is doing the network address translation. It's handing out IP addresses with DHCP. Um, it's got its own small stub DNS resolver on it. It's got single wireless SSID capability and it plugs directly into your cable modem or your ISP's device, which is then on the internet. In most cases, people don't even have any kind of wired presence network in their house. They're usually just using the wireless SSID. It's a very, very flat, model. In fact, when you look at most people's home network, it looks like this. Everything is flat. One SID. All the things I just said, simply a cable modem of some sort, a wireless router, and then good luck. You may have a desktop or something like that plugged into the router, but this is extremely common. And more to the point, on the inside of the network, if you take your average home router that's on the lower end of the price spectrum, they have hard coded into them 192.168.1.0/24, which is a class C network. 1.1 is the router gateway and the DNS server, and that's pretty much how 99% of networks out there are basically working. Right? It's a very simple model, but it is subject to 
trouble. First of all, an all-in-one router model like that is subject to a single point of failure. These things are not built to be very resilient. And if you transmit any significant amount of traffic, especially if you do things that hacker people do like me, those single point of failure devices will literally fall over dead, right? The other issue you run into here is default passwords are often used and never changed. Soft software vulnerabilities are often discovered and they can be internet facing. The firewall has little to no configurability very few features for changing the network configuration, right? And ISPs that don't do you any service by leaving defaults on things like their cable modems and those kinds of devices, this is a recipe for disaster from a security and operations perspective. And in fact, a couple of years ago, there were a number of articles that were floating around very, very active about how vulnerable home routers were. And this was right around the time of the Mirai botnet and when a lot of things got hit and everybody was like, wow, the whole internet is broken, right? I even remember my son saying the internet's broken, which is really, really kind of funny because I said to him, look, if you're that smart, if you broke the whole internet, you're going to make millions, kid. But of course, he didn't uh, actually say that. Okay, so the compromise possibilities are significant here. Firmware commonly out of date. People most often buy these routers off the shelf and they never, ever, ever check the version of software on the router or attempt to upgrade them since purchase date. And, you know, you talk about any number of these older devices, a D-Link, a Linksys, a TP-Link, there's a hundred thousand brands. They are all sharing vulnerable code amongst each other. They never get upgraded unless you deliberately go and upgrade them. They have known exploitable software vulnerabilities. They have remote administration accessible from the internet. Most of the time, what happens when they get exploited is the attacker just simply changes the DNS address so that all of your inside DNS activity in the network is being intercepted and then redirected by some sort of wildcard DNS response. So that's bad, right? It's called DNS hijacking. And uh, that's really funny, John. I about had a schism because you appeared on my screen on the exact opposite side. Yeah, wow. I just flipped on me too. So. <laughs> right? So DNS hijacking is a big deal. And if DNS hijacking occurs, it simply means this. There's going to be a wildcard response that sends all of your traffic to an attacker-controlled resource who's going to not only intercept, potentially change what comes back to you, and you may never know it, and credit cards and all kinds of things might be going across that, that path to the, the attacker, right? The other one that we've seen, and we have seen historical, is the uh, router being infected with malware, Mirai botnet and other That's, botnet, classic example, right? Yep, and, and it's interesting. We actually had, uh, well, I had an assessment a long, long, long time ago where I was allowed to go to someone's house and kind of the things that you've already chained together, he had a weak password to access his wireless network. Uh, we were able to jump on the wireless network once we were on the wireless network, we were then able to pivot to his home router with the default password. I think it was a Netgear. And then we changed the DNS settings to reroute all the traffic to a server that we had where we were forwarding most of his DNS traffic. But some of his DNS requests, we were going to a different site where we were harvesting credentials. So this isn't outside of the realm of like, no one would do this. Whenever you're looking at highly targeted attacks, if you're going to do a social engineering targeted attack or even just this type of attack, one of the things you need to know is where is your target? And if we know that your executives are at home in the Hamptons and that house is close to an alley that I can get access to that wireless network, absolutely a targeted attacker would actually go through that effort to be there because they know the target of opportunity is at that specific location. Precisely, precisely, right? Now, you might ask, what can you do about this today, right? And there are some things you can do. I This was really interesting to me. I was doing a little bit of research this week coming up to this talk, and I'm not trying to advertise any particular vendor here, just to, to be clear, but I did find that a number of the defense vendors, your, your antivirus, your endpoint defense folks, have actually started putting up home router security check pages. And so I, I actually grabbed uh, F-Secure's one here, and I hit the check my router button because I was like, I wonder what this do does, right? In a VM, of course. But anyway, when I did this, uh, it came back with a very simple green bar that said, hey, Joff, 
no issues were found on your router. And I'm like, phew, okay, I'm feeling good about this, I hope. So I clicked on the view the results in detail button. And when I did that, it actually comes back with what it detected as my DNS IP. I'm not quite sure how they pulled that one off, but I'm sure you could work it out if you thought about it long enough. The AS number, which is the autonomous system number of the network that you're connected to, the organization that runs that particular autonomous system, which is essentially a routing zone in the internet, the ISP related to it, the organization, the continent, the country, the location, all that good Wait, stuff, right? That's it? That's you didn't come back with it. ports or services or anything? Like, that's right. it? So I was like, okay, you gave me a green box and you gave me stuff about where my network is geographically. How does that tell me that my router has no issues? So I actually didn't take this further because I didn't have time because I was too busy hacking up this mobile app, which I talked about earlier. But what I probably should have done was opened up a few really obvious ports as a honeypot kind of thing and done it again just to see what would happen. And I do plan on doing that because I'm hoping they're running a little bit of a, a inbound scan in the check. Yeah, yeah. More to the point that what can you actually do if you're in this home router situation? today, like walking away from this presentation. Well, you can certainly go back and reset your device to factory settings. Every one of these little devices has, has a reset to defaults. Then you could find the vendor of that router, download the latest firmware, use your phone if you have to use it for the internet access, reconfigure your device, keeping the principle of least privilege and lowering your risk essentially by choosing a strong admin password, by disabling all your internet facing services, especially remote administration. Ensure that your wireless configuration has a nice strong and long pre-shared key or, or passphrase. Disable all the universal plug and play. Examine the firewall config. Use a little bit of common sense. Make sure you're not forwarding any ports that are internet facing into the inside of your network. And if you go through these basic steps, which are not too difficult for the average person, you're going to be in a much better place than just leaving things as they are with old firmware and default passwords and so on. Well, and, and I think the biggest one, honestly, is that passphrase. Um, yep. Try to come up with a good long passphrase. Uh, I would say, you know, getting to like 21 or more characters would be very, very solid. Because exactly. to be completely honest, whenever we're talking about cracking WPA, WPA2 passwords, I, I the only ones that we've ever cracked at BHIS are like fairly basic ones. Once you start getting ones that are over like 17 to 21 characters, it's just, it's not very likely that someone's going to crack that very easily. Yep, that's right. Um, uh, there also can be somewhat somewhat uh, challenging to actually capture the handshake sometimes, especially in the five gig space. So one of the extra recommendations that you could think about there is if your device has five gig only capability, then jump the frequencies up to five gig and, and leave out the 2.4 gigahertz space. It's a bit of a sideways recommendation there, but it gives you a little bit of frequency diversity and it's a little harder to find which channel you're on when you're in five gig. But uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, raising the game. So let's say that you are done with your single all-in-one all-purpose device, right? and you want to move away from that device, you, were, you would rather re-architect your network so that you have some separate devices for the different functions in your network. Maybe acquire a separate router and a switch, maybe some wireless equipment. Maybe you should you know, have that router focus more on DHCP, optionally uh, DNS services, provide a strong firewall configuration, provide an ability to segment your internal network, and then treat your wireless gear as separate equipment that's exclusively gonna bridge wireless traffic into your home router, right? So in other words, start stepping up and having purpose-built devices instead of a single all-in-one device. And it's gonna cost you more. I'm gonna tell you that right now, but it, it's going to give you a great deal more configurability in your home network. What you really want to do, the goal you want to go after is do a little bit of segmentation. And what I would recommend is this. If you can divide your inside of your home network into different trusted zones, and you can keep it fairly simple, 
This will actually buy you a little bit better security in your home environment. And this is what we all call network segmentation in the information security world as well as in the networking world, right? The, the simplest scheme that I could come up with that, that is pretty robust, I think, is just to go with a home office network zone, which is dedicated to the adults that are staying at home and working at home, their devices, then a guest and home entertainment network zone, which is kind of that middle position, a low trust zone, and then obviously the internet zone on the outside. So by doing this, we're actually just creating two segments on the inside of your network, two different lands, if you like, in networking terminology, where your home office zone is existing in one and everybody else, you know, kids, casual surfing, PC gaming, consoles, streaming entertainment is living in that other place. So this is, this is the sort of first level that you might wanna to go to, and it may well be sufficient for most people's purposes. In, in order to do this, we've gotta talk a little bit about some basic network engineering. John, have any thoughts on the scheme here? Oh, it John, we can't for me to have my mute button off. No, I think it's really solid and having that separation. I know a lot of people are talking about PFSense, they're talking about Pi Hole and um, a bunch of different types of router things that you can pull down online. But we're, we're kind of trying to hit that basic thing that you can give recommendations to the people that you work with. You don't want to say, hey, why don't you go implement Pi Hole to, to bill an accounting? That might not go over real well. Although I think he should actually do that. Yeah. <laughs> Doing well, that. you know, the, the real point is, the real point here is, as Der Derek and I actually discussed a little bit this week, solid security is built upon a foundation of good architecture. You've got to build that foundation of good architecture first, then you can add your whistles and bells on top. And that doesn't matter whether you're a home network operation or whether you're an enterprise network operation. It's all the same. You've got to build the foundation first, then you start layering on the extra security features. Well, and if we could set up, like in every single Soho wireless router I've ever seen has the ability of creating a main network and a guest network. Yep. And doing that type of separation saying, this is the network I'm gonna work from and I'm gonna have all the video games and all that crap run on another network is something anyone can do with almost any of their routers that they have at home. And it's a, it's a good solid recommendation to have that separation. Absolutely. So in order to do this, we need to talk about some basic network engineering. And as I was coming up with this presentation, I'm like, man, it's just as well I spent like 18 years building large networks because I think I got this covered, right? So I'm gonna give you, a, forgive me for doing this, I'm going to give you a little bit of a basic network education at this point. First of all, an ethernet layer two domain. Your IP address is not your real address on the network. Your real address is something called an ethernet address or media access control address. It is a 48-bit address that's baked into the NIC on your device. These days, more and more is software programmable, and you can only communicate with your computer through this layer two address, through this ethernet address, okay? In networking world, a single packet is not allowed to cross a bridge unless the bridging table has an entry for that packet on the other side of the bridge. Now, when you look at a simple home router or a switch, it really is what we used to call a bridge. It's just a multi-port bridge. It's got lots of bridges in it, if you like. A network segment is what we would call a single ethernet layer two domain, also known as a local area network. So the point here is the only real address on your laptop or your server or your workstation ha has, or even your phone, is the MAC address, which is that 48-bit address that can be, can be communicated to in this layer two domain. So you're all calling me liars now, right? You're saying, Joff, but wait, I've got this thing called an IP address. Well, how does this IP address relate to this ethernet MAC address? How are these things glued together? Well, in the case of IPv4, we developed a very special protocol called address resolution protocol. And the address resolution protocol is designed to operate within that layer two segment to allow your device to basically ask a question, to broadcast out to that layer two segment, hey, what is the MAC address associated with this IP address that I own? To basically create that glue or that mapping between those two addresses. 
so that your device knows when it transmits a packet to a specific IP address, there's always going to be an associated Ethernet address where that gets sent to. It has that mapping in what we call an ARP cache, right? So normally with IPv4, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between a single Ethernet address and a single IP address. IPv6 is going to break this greatly because there is usually a many-to-one mapping between multiple IPv6 addresses and a single MAC address. And that's because there's different scoping of IPv6 addresses in that protocol. Now, how do we assign the IP address? Years ago, when the internet was born, people just used to assign them statically. They used to just say, okay, I'm gonna program my computer. Its IP address is gonna be this specific address. And when it receives an op request, hey, what's the mapping? It's gonna say, oh yeah, that's me. I have this IP address. But pretty soon people realized that maintaining the, the list, probably a spreadsheet or something, of static IP addresses in the environment was highly irritating and really annoying. And thus was born a protocol called DHCP. DHCP's job 100% is to listen for a special broadcast, which is a computer asking for an IP address assignment. DHCP will respond and say, here is the IP address for you, and the computer subsequently will send out a gratuitous op request saying, hey, everybody, I own this IP address now. And so DHCP is an assignment mechanism for IP addresses. At layer three, the IP address actually consists of the following components. It consists of a network address, a network mask, a router gateway address, and then obviously individual endpoint addresses. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, when we're mapping a layer three domain into a layer two domain, we call it a subnetwork, right? And when we map that down, we can define exactly how many IP addresses are in that subnetwork. The way to do that is to define a network address and a network mask. All of the bits that are not turned on on the lower side uh, uh, of that mask field, it's a 32-bit field in IPv4, those represent how many hosts can belong to that network. So whenever we say slash 24, what we're talking about is all of the 24 bits that are actually turned on in the network portion of the, of the address. The remaining bits are eight, because 32 minus 24 is eight, and eight bits can be used for assigning addresses in that subnetwork, which is, if you know two to the power of eight, is 256 addresses. There is two special addresses in there. One of them is called the network address, which is not normally used for anything except for network broadcasts. The other one is called the broadcast address, which is not used for anything other than broadcasts, right? And then there's a third address that every network will have, and that's, that's the address that we assign to the router gateway. Now the router gateway address is really important. What happens when the PC tries to communicate on the network, if it tries to communicate with a network address th that is in that subnet, then it will just opt for that address and it will get a response and it will send a packet to directly to that system in that same LAN segment. If it tries to communicate with an address, an IP address that is not inside that subnet, it has no other choice but to talk to the router gateway. And the router gateway is responsible for forwarding that packet on to the place where that communication can continue, right? It is called routing. It is a routing function. So this is how we develop our land segments and how we develop our subnets. Now, all of your corporations do this, right? For example, this is a corporation that's got a it's actually a random image off the internet. But anyway, it's a corporation that's got a CAD station subnetwork. It's got a marketing subnetwork, right? These things have been assigned by the network administrator. There's something called a router in the middle. The router's job is to know which physical segment, which physical wire each one of these things is connected to and to forward those packets appropriately when it receives them. Now, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because. A lot of you are hearing the term VLAN, and you're wondering, 
what is this thing called a VLAN? Well, a VLAN and, is not some sort of magical special source. A and, VLAN was invented simply to save hardware expenses. VLANs essentially allow you to operate more than one LAN, LAN segment on the same physical infrastructure. And this gets really important whenever we're talking about how we dump these VPN users into our corporate networks. So whenever you're talking about this, we're not talking about teaching home users necessarily to set VLANs up at home, although that would be awesome. Quick, quick. We can talk a little bit about it. How many, <laughs> how many VLAN numbers are there? So let's see if people can come up with that pretty quickly on Discord. But this really, really applies to not just the, for home users, but whenever they connect into your network, where the hell do you put them? Because the big yeah. thing that you don't want to see is you don't want to see your remote users connected to insecure networks getting direct line access into your environment. Yeah, so the answer that came out online just then was 4096, which is true in the sort of version two specification. It when is. when it first came out uh, and Cisco, Cisco had their proprietary technology, they only used an eight bit field inside of the header and there was only 255 possible VLAN, zero up to 255. Then they extended it and somebody's saying, but there is extended. I know, I engineered this stuff for 20 years, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they extended it because the corporations out there said, you know, 255 is not enough, right? We, we've got like multi-floor buildings on multi, you know, kilometers or miles, square, square mile campuses. We need more subnetting. We need more VLANs than that, right? But a so VLAN is not a magical construct. A VLAN is really about saving on hardware costs. And the way that it works is that the identifier in the VLAN is put into a header in the ethernet packet. So it's, it's kind of a halfway header. And in fact, they extended the header by 14 bytes because of 802.1Q, the standard that actually inserted that information in the ethernet header. And so this tag, call it red, blue, yellow, whatever, tells the switch what segment that packet belongs to. In other words, what virtual LAN segment that packet belongs in. Now, all of you in the security community like myself became aware in the early days, and even today, this is still possible, that you can actually do something called double tagging where you can insert two VLAN tags into an ethernet frame. The switch will strip off the first tag then the packet goes along into the bridging table and lands in a VLAN bridging table where it shouldn't land. In other words, you've hacked a VLAN hopping mechanism. And it's very simple. It's because the switch is designed to read only the first tag and then it goes on its way and drops into another VLAN, which is, well, suboptimal for your hack. However, it is a unidirectional attack. I'm running out of time. So more to the point, what is NAT? Just a real quick primer on NAT. Network address translation is an address conservation technology that was invented many years ago. I don't remember who took credit for it, but we'll give Marcus Ranham some credit because we know Marcus had a lot to do with stuff. It allowed internet routing devices to translate one or more destination IP addresses to a different address. In other words, what your routing device is doing at home when it receives a packet that's destined for the internet and not for another local segment on your network, is that it is taking the source address of the packet and it is replacing it with the internet facing address and choosing an arbitrary port number as well. So this combination of network address translation as well as layer four port address translation that is possible here before it sends the packet back out. And the router keeps a table in it so it knows that that particular port that it inserted into the packet has a mapping back in the NAT table to the device that actually originally sent the packet. It's called a state table. And a very typical home router is going to NAT all the time, right? Because normally your internet provider is only gonna give you a single IPv4 publicly routable address. Now, let's go back to the original task. How would we segment our network? Well, one thing we could do is just cut it into the two pieces like I talked about. Have our trusted home network and have our guest network. And we are probably going to want to buy equipment 
that can support VLANing. And the reason we're going to want to buy equipment that can support VLANing is it will save us from having to buy more Ethernet ports on our routers and have separate switches to support the separate segments. And so VLANing is your hardware savings here. In this example, I actually did use separate equipment in the diagram because I think Ethan gave me the diagram and it's the one I could find in a hurry. But what I did was assigned a IP subnetwork to VLAN 10 and another IP subnetwork to VLAN 20. And what I like to do, and you'll see a lot of network engineers do that, is take the third octet of the IP subnetwork and map it to the VLAN number because that's a nice convenient thing so that you can know how your network is mapped out and you don't have to sort of keep yourself a, a spreadsheet or a piece of paper. Now, obviously that's a little bit predictable, but on the inside of your network, it's really a useful thing to be able to do. Now, this is not exactly how my network is mapped out. In case you're wondering, I know how you all think, right? How do you assign these addresses? There is an RFC, RFC 1918, which allows us to use three reserved address blocks. All of these address blocks have been reserved for many, many years since network address translation was invented. And they are the 10.000 slash eight, which is a huge network. It is a class A network in IPv4 speak. 172.16.0.0 slash 12, and then 192.168.00 slash 16. So you have plenty of choices here. Personally, I prefer to use the 10.000 stuff and actually divide that out into the different subnetworks sub that I like, but you can choose from any of these address spaces when you're segmenting your network. So let's imagine that you succeed in segmenting your network into two pieces. So now you have on your switch, you've assigned all of your corporate office network people, which is probably just you, into VLAN 20. And let's say you have configured your wireless SSID related to your home office network to VLAN 20, and then you've put everybody else into VLAN 10. And those two VLANs, those virtual LANs, are going to come back in to your router gateway, and they are going to undergo routing and or network address translation. Now, this is a very important point. If your router is permitted to route traffic from VLAN 10 to 20, in other words, to route traffic from 10.0.10.0 slash 24 over to the 10.0.20, dot zero slash 24, then you have not achieved any security gain. You have simply divided your network into two subnetworks. In fact, the only thing you've achieved is to prevent broadcast traffic but going between those two networks, and that is Ethernet layer broadcast traffic. That's the only thing you've achieved. So if you need to get further than that, which I would recommend that you do, you have to go into the firewall on your device and deliberately block traffic between the 10.0.10.0 network and the 10.0.20.0 network, but still allow both of those independent networks to NAT out to the internet. What are some solutions that we can talk about? So I'm talking about this in the abstract and in kind of an educational context, but when we get down to it, we actually need some equipment that can support the segmentation mechanism and the segmentation goals that we have. There are many interesting solutions out there on the market today that has greatly improved the landscape from where it used to be. Look, my attitude, classic old guy, I'll admit to it, get off my lawn, but when I started doing this and being at home a lot, six or seven years ago, I was disgusted and was not interested at all in any of the home networking equipment on the market. And my response was to go out and buy some sort of system I could run an Ubuntu Linux on, put multiple NICs in it, and build the home router myself from the ground up. And I still do that to this day. But fortunately for all of us, the market has greatly improved 
and there are many options out there now. DDWRT, for those who want to re-image things like Linksys hardware. PFSense is a great solution. Ubiquity has, has been doing amazing things with their wireless and routing gear for that, that in targeting the, the home and almost small uh, semi-corporate small business market. Microtech, John mentioned earlier, have been doing incredible things. And, you know, if you don't mind uh, Russian code running in your home network, um, I'll leave that for you to judge. And then I put a notable mention on here at the end. And this is because uh, mostly because Bo Bullock and, and Derek in the team had mentioned to me this particular thing. There's this little thing called Firewaller. If you want to actually scale up your security monitoring beyond just the routing and segmentation, Firewalla has got some interesting security monitoring possibilities that you can tie in with a phone app. And I was really kind of impressed with it. And maybe someday we can have uh, Bo give us a demo, but it was some really neat stuff. And this, these are not the only products that are out there, but my real point is things have gotten a lot better. And a lot of the interfaces on these products now, unlike the good old days, allow you to do segmentation directly inside of a web interface that has appropriately been secured with a strong password and allow you to do some stuff that that doesn't require you to have a ton of network engineering experience which is really cool hey joffer yeah what's the price range on those solutions oh man you're asking me two hard questions it's about um, 150 bucks yeah Ish. Yeah, that was Derek. So you're gonna you're gonna start in a more expensive. Let, let's just let's just give some ranges here. Your typical home network routing solution is gonna be 50 bucks and below. If you're trying to segment and step up to the next level, you don't want that 50 bucks and below level equipment. If you're trying to step up to this level, you want to be spending between 100 and 200 dollars on some sort of solution that's more capable. And if you build out separate wireless access points in your house into some sort of mesh arrangement, you're probably going to spend even more than that. So be prepared to spend a little bit more money. You're going to be in a different price point, but it's it's legit. It's worth it. You get a lot for that. Now, I want to bring John back in if he's still with us. He could have disappeared, but if he is, he, he can come back in and talk about this. From a consulting perspective, we're seeing a huge impact of this pandemic shift. And the pandemic shift has caused this to happen. What used to be pretty much select groups that were always remote workers has now turned into everybody being a remote worker. So the question people are scrambling to respond to right now is, especially the network engineers out there, we had all this really well corporate segmented, wonderful security mechanisms in place, really well distributed monitoring. We had covered all the offices so beautifully. Everything was subnetted beautifully. We had our corporate network just amazingly configured. And now everybody has gone home and they're all using the same pair of redundant VPN concentrators. And we have everybody coming into the same access layer on our network. We never planned for this. We never actually segmented our VPN because we never expected to have this problem. So the response for a lot of folks, unfortunately, has been a response of convenience. It has been a response of, oh my God, the VPN policy just fit the sales group. Now let's just relax it so it fits the entire corporation. And unfortunately, I believe it has had the net effect of lowering the security profile in the organization. And not only that, as we mentioned earlier, people have also started engaging in split tunneling because their VPN systems are just not capable of handling everybody's remote corporate and internet traffic at the same time. And so we have a significant security and operational scaling issue here. That was easy. <laughs> Beautiful. So, have you had to reduce security to accommodate these remote users? Probably so. Do you have the resources to scale the to scale and handle the load? Probably not. 
There are additional technical support issues here. There are additional questions that are coming from the users. This is a real challenge and it's going to take us a while to respond. Your internet provider for your corporation just became a lifeline. Do you have redundancy and failover? Do you have sufficient bandwidth to handle all of your access layer of your network coming in from remote? What about your service level agreements and your support from the ISP? These are real issues that we're going to have to grapple with. And I would, I would contend that the remote working paradigm that we have just shifted into is not going to change back to what it was probably ever. We have probably shifted the culture for a great proportion of our workers perpetually at this point. And that's all I've got for you now, folks. There's a few links up here. We've got Black Hills InfoSec home network design. We've got my how to create a Soho router using Ubuntu. Troy Hunt wrote a great article on Ubiquity, all the things. And uh, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say, stay healthy, keep your social distance and virtual hugs to everybody. And let's go to questions and answers. Yes, I got, one from, I got one from Stan. It said, here's a question. We have some requirements for a pen tester to be on site at specific regions, not exposed to the internet. And I don't really want testers coming in over the same VPN as the rest of the org users. Any ideas? I mean, honestly, I don't have a clean answer for that. And the I, reason no, why is when you're looking at like, we talked about SCADA, HIPAA, all these different networks, they're actually talking about people that work at power plants sleeping at the power plant so they never go home just because they cannot remotely connect. And I think that I don't have a clean answer for that. A separate VPN maybe, I don't know. And if anybody else on Discord, Joff, what are your thoughts on it? So, so my thoughts is, what are you trying to test? Like if, if you are commissioning a penetration test, you need to look at it from a realistic threat modeling perspective. And so if your test is driven towards a certain specific client base in your network that already remote into that VPN, then you do want the, your penetration test is coming into the same VPN because you want to simulate the same conditions, right? If you have a situation where you don't offer a VPN and you don't want the pen testers coming in, I don't think you really have a choice other than either bring them on site or temporarily stand up a VPN to, uh, to simulate the access and stand it down again when you're done. But there's not a really good clean way um, in, in that scenario. Hey, Josh, someone wants to know if we ever pen tested or come across or exploited split tunneling. And I don't like, maybe we stumbled across that. So interesting. I think John actually had an answer for that earlier. Yep. Have we penetration um, tested or, or exploited split tunneling? Yeah, yeah. John, why don't you uh, address that one? Yes. So two, oh, two, one specific story is the one I told you about attacking the home network and getting access to an executive's computer that way. The other one, Joff, is a lot of times our customers will send us a notebook computer and they'll say, yep. this is our standard build for our road warriors. What are the security issues with it? And I can think of at least five or six tests that we've had where they send us their road warrior laptop. And then we go through and say, here's all the ways we can put malware on it. Here's all the ways that we can attack this thing. Here's what you can do to try to lock it down. So yes, absolutely. Yep. We have tested it. Yes, absolutely. We have exploited it. And it's, all, it's never good. Uh, split tunneling. And I understand it's a necessary evil. I know there's people on Discord that'll be like, but we have to do it. I get that. But kind of what Joff was talking about on the previous slide, this may be the new normal that we're dealing with. There's a bunch of things in security, folks, that are horrific. Joff was talking about address resolution protocol. That is one of the most insecure protocols on the internet. <laughs> it's horrible. DNS. DNS is equally bad, right? But we've had to deal with it because that's just the way things are. And I'm starting to think that maybe the split tunneling, tunneling problem is just going to be the way things are. Yeah, so um, no, that's interesting. And I, and I did forget to mention the send us your Road Warrior laptop because we've done those kinds of tests many, many times. And, and not even in just the split tunneling context, even in a full tunnel context, uh, we have been able to exploit entire environments uh, simply from the Road Warrior laptop. Well, there was uh, the one that we attacked, because remember, even if you're using a VPN at work, and you disallow split tunneling, it has to get DHCP from the local network, and it has yep. to get DNS from the local network, because that comes from DHCP. 
and you can sneak in and exploit these systems before they even have an opportunity to establish the full VPN and stop that split tunneling. So there's always that window of opportunity that exists using the techniques that Joff was talking about earlier. You know, I'll, I'll give you another example. I had a laptop that, in this case, it, it, it wasn't actually split tunneled, but I was trying to map out the internal network that the customer had and their VPN configuration sent down a list of really discrete routes. So all I had to do was look at the route table and I knew the structure of their internal network. So sneaky, huh? <laughs> anyway. So the other thing I did wanna mention uh, in the split tunneling configuration, what we are seeing out there is incidents of uh, a lot of O365 deployment, and this is not unusual, but people had prior configured their O365 so that you couldn't get to it unless you were in the corporate network. But now there's this tendency to relax and split tunnel and then open up O365. Now, one of the issues that Black Hills has exploited multiple times in the past, and many other pen testing firms have as well, is that O365, if misconfigured with legacy authentication protocols, allows us a single factor of authentication which if we use a password spraying type of approach can actually gain us access into that environment in a relatively quick way. And if you relax your VPN policies and your access to your O365 in association with COVID-19, you are literally opening the door for that kind of attack. Hey folks, thanks a bunch for coming. Any other questions, comments from the gallery at Black Hills or responses to folks there. I'm sort of not really watching the Discord too much because I've been talking too much. <laughs> yeah. So Jeff, we'll we'll do some post show banter because I think we have some questions here in the in the questions window that we should address. But I would say uh, final thoughts and then we'll kill the recording and then just do a rapid fire questions. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, so uh, Joff touched on it. This is the new normal working remotely um, and literally everything in security is going to have to change and accelerate a bunch of things that we are already looking at. You're going to see compliance, certification, and accreditation has got to change. You're going to see cloud security technologies that were lagging behind as far as what they could do from a security perspective are going to have to catch up. And you're in this influx zone right now in security. What's happened a number of times before, it happened in 2008, it happened in 2003, and you're in this zone right now where there's gonna be a huge seismic change in the way that we do things. Now, lucky for us, we've seen the change in the movement to cloud computing coming. We've been making that change slowly. Now it's gonna happen a hell of a lot faster. 